webinar today is familiar with BayPath, so I'd like to give you a bit of background information about BayPath University. We were established in 1897, and so we have a long history of providing educational opportunities for both women and men throughout the United States and internationally, offering both on-campus and online programs at the graduate level for both men and women, and at the undergraduate level for women only. Accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, Baypath University is a leader in education and offers a wide array of degrees that are focused on some of the most emergent careers such as higher education, genetic counseling, mental health counseling, applied data science, occupational therapy, leadership and negotiation, cybersecurity, and many more. At Baypath University, education empowers undergraduate women and graduate women and men to become leaders in their careers and communities with an innovative approach to learning that prepares students to flourish in a constantly changing world. Our over 30 online and on-ground graduate programs are perfect for the professionals and the pragmatists, for women and men juggling families and full-time jobs, in fact, 90% of our students work and attend graduate school at the same time. You are able to do so because we make your education as accessible and manageable as possible. And if you ask a Baypath Women undergraduate student to define her academic experience, it would be one word, transformational. There is no other way to describe it. We have majors in neurobiology, cybersecurity, and business analytics, biotechnology, and legal studies, but we also educate the whole person. At Baypath University, students receive a great deal of personal attention through the admissions process and during their experience as a student. Our professors are both practitioners and faculty and bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the classroom. In addition, they are committed to giving our students the best support and encouragement throughout their experience. Again, thank you for joining us today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joshua Weiss. Dr. Weiss is a senior fellow at the Harvard Negotiation Project, a subsidiary of Harvard University's Program on Negotiation, a consortium comprised of faculty, staff, and students from Harvard MIT and Tufts University. He is also the co-founder of the Global Negotiation Initiative at the HNP. In addition, Dr. Weiss is the founder of Negotiation Works Incorporated, consulting for a number of Fortune 500 companies, the United Nations, and the US government. He delivers negotiation and mediation training and courses, and is tasked with negotiation and mediation at the organizational, corporate, government, and international levels. Welcome, Dr. Weiss. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. I just wanna put my webcam on to say hello. I'm gonna turn it off because it is usually more distracting than helpful, but um, just so you can put a face with a name here, etc. So thanks for taking the time out of your day to join me uh, to talk a little bit about negotiation. And um, as you might've gathered the title, uh, intended to be a bit provocative and uh, I'm glad that you um, thought to join to hear a little bit about this perspective on uh, negotiation. So um, one of the first things that I typically ask people is, you know, what do you know about negotiation and how did you come to know it? For a lot of us, um, you know, we learn about it uh, primarily through the, the media. We hear it thrown around in the public sphere. Uh, we may occasionally hear about it in um, our workplace when you're thinking about a salary negotiation or a job interview, um, or you uh, think about it when you're going to buy a car or home. But for most of us, um, we don't really have a detailed knowledge about negotiation because we don't think we do it that much. And in fact, the reality is actually that we're negotiating every day all the time. And so 
some of these things on your screen are where you may have learned about negotiation. And most of um, those places where you're learning about negotiation are not telling you um, really what negotiation is all about and why it is so incredibly helpful. And as a result of that, there are a series of myths that exist around negotiation that I really wanna confront today and, um, and share those with you. And hopefully we'll have some time uh, before we stop so that you can ask some questions and we can dig a little bit deeper. But my goal today is to try to debunk a number of myths that exist about negotiation that are sort of in the popular lexicon. Um, so Cheryl, next slide, please. So I just wanna make sure that I'm very clear about um, the kinds of negotiations that I'm talking about, okay? So there are really um, two types of negotiations or two approaches to negotiation. The first type of negoti negotiation is what we often would call a positional or a distributive negotiation. These tend to be negotiations that are solely around uh, price. So sometimes these mirror more bargaining or haggling as opposed to really negotiating and understanding what's important to people. Um, my perspective is that I think a lot of people, when they think of negotiation, tend to think of um, the positional or distributive approach. It's a high-low way of doing things. You, know, you start high um, on one end, you start low on the other, concessions are expected, uh, and you land somewhere in the middle, something like that. But the conversation rarely goes beyond that. And <clears throat> those kinds of negotiations may be um, useful in one-off scenarios. Now, I think it's important to say that most people, when they're negotiating, are, are negotiating with the same people over and over again. Um, so I would venture to guess, and typically when I ask, when I do trainings in companies and organizations, and I say, how many of your negotiations are one-off kinds of scenarios? Most people say about 10%, which leaves about 90% uh, of their negotiations being with the same people over and over again. So if you're going to use the positional or distributive approach, you want to make sure that it is related to a one-off kind of negotiation scenario. And again, that might be buying a house or a car. Um, but in the workplace, those uh, kinds of negotiations are further and further uh, away from being the norm and, and what most people um, focus on today. The second type of negotiation approach is something called an interest-based approach to negotiation. Um, an interest-based approach to negotiation was made popular and famous by the book Getting to Yes that was written uh, in 1981. And um, that book talked about the importance of really understanding things well beyond just price and money and et cetera, that there are lots of things that motivate people in negotiation. So today, many of the myths that I'm gonna talk about relate really to both, but in some ways they relate to some of the common ideas that were associated with more of a positional or distributive way of doing things, okay? Um, so Cheryl, if you could go to the next slide. So the first myth that I'm gonna put in front of you and try to challenge a bit is that compromise is synonymous with negotiation. I hear this all the time. In fact, when I ask people, what are the, the words that come to mind when you think of negotiation, compromise is the first thing uh, that, that, or at least in the top five that people tend to, to share. So why would I say this is a myth? Um, <clears throat> so it's a myth because in effective negotiation, um, you go in with an objective and um, I think part of the reason that people don't like to negotiate is that they think they have to compromise on what's most important to them. And they connect this notion of giving up something that's really valuable to them with the negotiation process. And sometimes compromise is necessary. However, um, more often than not, if people can get into a creative mode of problem solving and thinking, um, differently and understanding what's really important to people, um, then they don't have to compromise. What they actually want to be doing is 
problem solving and brainstorming and thinking about creative solutions to the challenges in front of them. And one of the real problems that I see with people as they negotiate is that they don't go to that place. Um, they will tend to stay in this back and forth, how they think they ought to negotiate. And they don't get into kind of a creative space where they're beginning to think, well, what's really important to this person? And is it possible for them to get what they want? Um, there's a great story that exemplifies this um, from, from that book, Getting TS. And there, this, the story is a bit of an iconic example of how the interest-based approach works. So the story goes that there are two girls who are um, arguing over an orange and they decide to cut the orange in half and split it. And once they've split the orange, one of the girls peels the peel and throws the peel away and then eats the fruit. And the other girl um, peels the peel, puts it aside um, and throws away the fruit because she actually needed the peel to make an orange cake. Had they talked about why it was that they wanted the orange or what part of the orange, they might have both been able to uh, benefit. And this is what happens is quickly, too often in negotiation, people rush to compromise, especially when things get difficult. And so as a result, um, they compromise on something that perhaps is not necessary. It, it didn't need to be, there didn't need to be a compromise because there was actually a way of solving the problem or the negotiation challenge that was in front of them differently. Okay, Cheryl, next myth, please. So the next myth is that reaching agreement is the mark of success in negotiation. Um, now, this is a, a challenging one for a lot of people because most people go into negotiation thinking that the purpose of negotiation is to reach agreement. It's not. The purpose of negotiation is to meet your objective, however you define them. So um, if I go in to a process and I say, okay, my objective is this, and I go through the negotiation process and I come out the other side realizing that, you know, I can't really meet my objective as best as possible by reaching an agreement here. In fact, I could actually walk away to something better or different. Then that's actually a successful negotiation because I, again, am thinking what's the best way to meet my objective. When you use this notion of reaching agreement as being the mark of success in negotiation, um, not only might you reach bad agreements, but um, those agreements that you reach may very well not actually meet your interest or that whatever objective it is that you have. Um, I remember one of my first jobs with a, a company they hired me to come in, the, the sort of C-suite folks brought me in and said, we want you to figure out why our sales team is underperforming. And I said, okay, simple enough. Um, so I met with the sales team and I said, tell me about your negotiations and why you think perhaps you're not getting where you wanna go or where your company wants you to go. And they said, well, um, you know, our metric is to come back with an agreement. And I said, any agreement? And they said, yeah, as long as we come back with an agreement, we're okay. So they were being given a metric that basically said, doesn't matter what's in the agreement, come back with an agreement. Um, and not a good agreement. And so in fact, a lot of their agreements were downers for the company. And that's what can happen when you have reaching agreement as the mark of success and negotiation, um, is that you end up with agreements that may be okay, but more often than not, there's something we call agreement bias. So people will feel a tremendous amount of pressure to reach um, some kind of agreement because they think that's what they're supposed to be doing in negotiation as opposed to trying to meet their interest as best as possible. So if you shift and you see negotiation uh, and what you're doing is trying to meet your objective as best as possible, that's a much better way of, of viewing success in negotiation than actually this idea of just reaching agreement. Okay, um, next one, please, Cheryl. So um, the, the third myth is that negotiations are predictable and plans are critical. Um, 
Now, why would I say that? So the reason I say that, and I pick up on what President Dwight Eisenhower once said, which is that plans are useless, but planning is everything. And there's a big difference between planning and plans. So the problem with plans in negotiating in, partic in negotiation in particular is that negotiation is an interdependent process. So I have to uh, work with somebody else and ultimately in the end, you know, part of my challenge is can I get them to yes, right? Um, but the problem is that that other person is not reading my playbook. They don't come at the negotiation the way I am. And so if I have a concrete plan and the other side doesn't follow it, then um, I begin to lose some confidence. I begin to lose a sense of where I'm going. And that's in fact when people make some of their biggest mistakes. On the flip side, what you ought to be doing is planning. Um, and I, along with a lot of other people in the world of negotiation, equate this to um, playing chess. So when you play chess, you know, you're always thinking a few steps ahead and you're contingency planning. So the planning process is incredibly valuable for negotiation because you start to think to yourself, okay, if I were to go down this road to try to meet my objectives, um, what might happen? And if they were to say no to that avenue of thought, then what would I do, right? So that you begin to develop a series of contingency plans. Um, and so you're not wedded to any one, but you have thought through very carefully um, what are the different ways I could try to take this process? And you also need to be flexible um, in your mindset. So I have a colleague um, at Harvard, a wonderful um, teacher named Mike Wheeler, who wrote a book called The Art of Negotiation. And in that book, he argues that the most successful negotiators are those people who learn the skills of improv. And improv is, of course, all about thinking on your feet. And when it comes to improv, you don't have a plan. Um, you have to, uh, you know, think about what's being put in front of you and then manage your way from there. So that's what you want to do. You want to go through the planning process so that you've got in your head different ways that you might take things, but not have a specific plan because that can actually create more anxiety uh, in the process and not less. All right, Cheryl, next one, please. So the fourth myth is that negotiation is about keeping information close to the vest and never making the first offer. Now, if you're in a positional or distributive negotiation, um, this is the model that most people use, that they um, don't want to share information because that might reveal something. And in particular, um, they don't want to make the first offer because they think whoever makes that first offer is giving away too much information. Um, if you're involved in positional negotiations, um, there's some logic to this. But for most of us, in, in those negotiations where we're negotiating with people over and over again, the currency of negotiation is information. So the only way for us to reach the best deal possible is for you to understand what really matters to me and and vice versa. And so I have to share some information. Now, that doesn't mean that I share all of the information right away. It means that I test the waters a bit. I'll say to the other side, look, I'm going to share something that matters to me. Um, and that is part of my goal here. Part of my objective is to have that need satisfied. And my expectation is that, that you're going to do the same kind of thing. And we're going to engage in a reciprocal sharing of information. Now, if somebody doesn't engage in that um, and is unwilling to share some things, then they're playing that other game. So if you think about the positional approach to negotiation and the interest-based negotiation approach as two different games, right? One of the things that you need to do is get people playing the same game. And if you believe that you know, you're negotiating with somebody and you want a long-term relationship with them, you need to help them to understand there's a different way of doing things and that actually sharing information really helps. Um, my perspective on making the first offer is that if you understand the situation fairly well, um, making the first offer is a way of 
putting out your agenda and anchoring the negotiation. So this no, there's a notion, uh, this notion of anchoring essentially means that when I put out, say, the first number in a negotiation, um, it's very common that you and I will get anchored around that first number unless you know differently to push back. Um, it's a very normal kind of thing. Now, the reason, I'll say one other thing about information. The reason that you share information is because, like I said, you might have other interests or things that are important to you. And I was working with an organization, just as a quick example, I was working with a company and um, doing a negotiation training. And they were explaining to me how they had a great relationship with this one client that they were serving and that the contract was up and that they were really looking forward to working with them going forward. And I said, you know, let me just out of curiosity, let me ask you a question. Do you think there's any way to make your negotiated agreement better than what it currently is? And they sort of looked at me funny and said, well, what do you mean? It, you know, we're, we're fine. We're going to re-up for another three years. What's, you know, how would we make it better? And I said, well, have you asked the client if there's anything else that would matter to them that they could include, that you all could include in the agreement that perhaps didn't cost you a whole lot um, and maybe didn't cost you anything. And then in return, there might be something that, that you could ask for uh, on your end. And so, so the folks that were there thought about it. And um, a couple of weeks later, one of them turned back to me and said, you know, we kind of took your advice and asked the other negotiator whether there was something that would be of value to them. And it turns out that um, if they could make their payment um, at the beginning of the quarter instead of the end, that mattered to them. And there was one other element that was important to them. And on the flip side, they were able to get a contract extended from three to five years. And for them as a, as a company, that stability helped a lot. And the only way that came about was because they were sharing information uh, and talking about what's important to them and why. And some of that requires trust. Some of it requires um, having worked together for a bit, but there are ways of doing this early on in a negotiation to see if you can't shift the game, if you will. All right, Cheryl. So the fifth myth is that you have to keep emotions out of negotiation. Um, you know, the world of negotiation has been around uh, since time immemorial, but the study of negotiation really began in the early 1950s in the world of economics. And, um, you know, economists essentially said at that time that emo it was very important to keep emotions out of things and to remain calm. Um, emotions are made up of uh, people, obviously, and people are both logical and emotional creatures, right? I think we would all agree with that statement. Um, if I were to say to you, let's keep logic out of a negotiation, you would tell me I'm an idiot. Um, and similarly, you can't keep emotions out of negotiation. They find their way in. In fact, if you try to suppress your emotions, um, they often come back in the way that perhaps the guy who's breathing fire um, is exhibiting. You know, they come back as anger or they come back as emotions that are being quelled as opposed to emotions that are part of the process. So when I see people becoming, and well, let me say one other thing, which is that often people equate emotionality with irrationality. And I don't believe that to be true at all. Um, there are many cultures, for example, around the world and even within our country where um, speaking emotionally is part of their culture. And there's nothing irrational about it. So the better um, approach is to enable negotiations to have their say, if you will. So you want to have them, but with some control and bring them out and, for example, express to someone that you're angry, that you're frustrated, as opposed to not saying something and those then coming out and exploding. And I think if you look at um, all of the work on emotional intelligence, that's in part, what they're talking about is that you've got to find a way to bring your emotions to the table um, without them overwhelming you. And again, some colleagues of mine um, at Harvard wrote a, a really good book called Beyond Reason, 
uh, which talks very much about how um, bringing positive emotions to the table is fundamental to successful negotiation, actually. Um, so this is an important one to, to debunk. Cheryl? So the hardest part of negotiating is the other party, myth number six. Um, I can tell you that when my the students in the Bay Path master's degree program in leadership and negotiation come in, I tell them um, there are two major components to this effort uh, to learn to be an effective leader and negotiator. The first is that you're going to learn about dynamics. You're going to learn about theories, skills, ideas, etc. And you're going to learn about people, the people that you deal with on the other side of the table. But more importantly, um, you're going to learn a lot about yourself. And if you're not really willing to learn about yourself, um, you're going to struggle as a leader and negotiator. The reason I say that is because the, there are so many biases that we have. There are so many assumptions that we make on a daily basis. We hold a perception of the world. Um, and all of those things make their way into the negotiation process. And if you're not aware of them, and if you don't address, for example, the weaknesses that you might have and build on the strengths, then those things become debilitating and really become the hardest part of negotiating because um, people, for example, might be able to push your buttons or might be able to send you down a road that you don't want to go because you're not able to manage yourself and deal with some of those challenges. So. In order to be an effective negotiator, you've really got to turn the mirror inward and say, what are those things that I really struggle with? And how am I going to manage those? You know, I, I had somebody once say to me, you know, I have this boss and every time I go in there, he says this thing and it really sets me off. And he said, you know, and he drives me crazy and he knows he does it all the time. And I said to him, well, okay, um, if you know he does it every time, then maybe you should change your response to it as opposed to waiting for him to change, which I don't think is going to happen. Um, and, you know, from there forward, he got the message that how he responds is within his control. And I say that to my kids a lot. They don't like to hear it, but it's the truth that, you know, other people aren't making you angry. You're allowing yourself to, to feel that way. So negotiation and being an effective negotiator requires a tremendous amount of understanding of yourself um, in order to manage the process. All right, Cheryl, myth seven, please. So myth seven is that tangible issues are at, the, are at the heart of most negotiations. So by tangible issues, I mean money, things that you can touch, right? And so why would that be a myth? Aren't those important? They are important. And yet, what I see time and again in many negotiations is that the intangible in issues that underlie a lot of negotiations, whether it's people's identity or their need to save face or respect, um, all of those things are as important, if not more important in a negotiation um, than the tangible. You can probably think of a time when you felt disrespected, for example. Well, no, no amount of money is going to change that, right? And so you've got to think very carefully about those intangible interests and what might be going on for um, that other negotiator. Um, I'll share a, a, a quick story about this. So a friend of mine was help was contacted by somebody who was trying to buy a radio station in Boston, and there were three um, owners of the radio station. And this, this guy had, had reached agreement with two of the three to purchase the radio station. And he was unable to get the other person to, to buy in. And he tried everything. He even offered this individual twice what he offered the other uh, two people that he had bought out. And the person wasn't budging. So he asked my colleague, what, what should I do? Like, what's going on here? And he said, well, tell me about this um, individual who won't sell. And he said, well, he's 55 years old. He was the founder of the radio station. He's the general manager of the radio station and he works there every day. And so my colleague said, well, does he, uh, does he enjoy what he does? And he said, yeah, he seems to, um, you know, he's the general manager. So he's there, works long hours, et cetera. 
And so my colleague said, well, do you think maybe that's what's going on here, that he's not ready to let go of what he's doing and what's going on? And I said, maybe. He said, why don't you go ask him? Why don't you take that tact? And it turned out that um, this was, you know, for this third uh, person, um, this was his baby. He had created it. And more importantly, he loved running the radio station on a daily basis. And so to make a long story short, um, what they ultimately agreed to was um, less money. Basically, he paid them what he paid the other people, uh, but that he was able to stay on as general manager for as long as he wanted with his current salary. And it really came down to, for him, he would say, well, if I were to sell to you and I wasn't the general manager, I wouldn't know what to do with myself because I love doing this. That is not about money. That's about these intangible issues that underlie most of our negotiations. And if you think about your own negotiations, you can identify some of those things, whether they're obvious or not. And if you do run into problems, um, you want to start thinking in that intangible realm. Is there something that happened that is turning them off? Because if you don't, uh, then you're probably not going to get where you want to go. All right, Cheryl, myth eight, please. So when someone has power in negotiation, there's nothing you can do. Um, so why would that be a myth? Um, so look, the, there are times when, when people have power um, and it's somewhat absolute and there really isn't something you can do. But there's a lot of other times when um, power is not nearly as clear cut as that. And in fact, what happens is that people's views of power are absolute, that they have it and I don't. And there are many sources of power. You know, money is one of them, but knowledge is another. Knowing how to negotiate is another. Uh, within an organization, if I have a certain skill set and a certain knowledge that nobody else has, um, then I have power. I can tell you, having run a nonprofit organization for the better part of 10 years, when I had an employee who was a really good employee, um, they had a lot more power than they realized because I didn't want to lose them. Um, it's hard to find good employees. So one of the things that you want to do is really think about power, not in absolute terms, but different levels of power and ask yourself the question, what power in, do I have in this situation? Um, about three or four years ago, I made a, a video that's available on YouTube, if you're interested, about how to view power differently. And um, you know, some of you may want to take a look at that because I think it just helps to um, help you all realize that power is often not absolute. And if you think creatively, there are things that you can do to try to manage power uh, when it does emerge in a negotiation process. All right, Cheryl, number nine. So negotiators should focus on the positions of the other side. Now we've talked a little bit about um, this positional versus interest-based approach to negotiation, right? So positions are what people say they want and interests are why they want them. So if you only focus on the positions, um, then you are missing a tremendous amount. And this you know, connects back to what we were talking about with regard to sharing of information, right? Interests are about what you value, about what's important to you. And you see the little cartoon of the window closed and the window open. So this is another little story from getting to yes. And as the story goes, there was a, a, a gentleman in the library um, and he, he wanted the windows closed because he was working on uh, a number of things. And there was another person sitting nearby who wanted the window open uh, because he was warm. So the two were arguing in, the, in a library and of course for librarians, that's the worst possible case scenario because they want to keep things quiet. So the librarian came over and said to the first person, you want the window open. Why do you want the window open? He said, because I'm really warm um, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sleepy and it's helping me to stay awake. And then she said to the other person, you want the window closed. Why do you want the window closed? Uh, and he said, because it's blowing my papers all around. So she said, well, what if you were to switch places because the wind seems to be coming down toward you and that way this gentleman can have the wind and keep himself awake and you can then move and your papers won't be blowing all over the place. 
So when we understand what those things are that are motivating um, ourselves and the other person in a negotiation, we can come up with all kinds of interesting solutions that don't require one person to get something and another to not. So we have to move beyond positions. So when somebody says, this is what I want, okay? Your next question should be why? Why is that so important to you? Can you help me understand? Um, and when you do that, you'll be way ahead of most people who don't say that and get caught in a back and forth kind of struggle um, with the other. And then they get locked in and they don't get anywhere and maybe they end up with some bad compromise. Um, okay, Cheryl, number 10, please. Oh, um, and by the way, just as when we were shifting away from that slide, maybe Cheryl, would you just go back to it? Um, one way to think about this is the iceberg. So um, positions are kind of the tip of the iceberg. And if any of you know a lot about icebergs, I'd be surprised if you do. But if you do, um, about 10% is above the surface. And then there's 90% below. Right. So um, think about, you know, positions are that 10 percent. It's the tip of the iceberg that's poking out through the surface. And then 90 percent of what's going on in a negotiation and what's important in a negotiation happens below the surface. And so your job is a bit of a detective to understand what are those interests? What are those things that are motivating the other side? OK, Cheryl, let's go to number 10. Now. So. Myth number 10 is that the negotiation pie is fixed and the process is just about dividing it. Now, there are a lot of people who will walk into a negotiation and say, OK, this is what's in front of us. Let's just try to figure out who's going to get what. But in many negotiations, there's an opportunity to expand the pie. Um, if we go back to my example of um, the company who had this contract with the client and they were both happy, right? they were dividing the pie in a certain way. And when they went back to ask the question, can we make this agreement better for both of us, what they were doing was expanding the pie, right? So for one of them, um, you know, paying uh, at the beginning of, a, beginning of a quarter as opposed to the end had value. And for the other, that longer term had value. So what we're talking about is metaphorically expanding the pie um, so that people get more value than could be had. And you don't, the problem is that you don't get there if you view what you're doing in negotiation as just simply dividing what's in front of you. You've got to go through a creative process to see if there's a way to expand the pie before you actually begin dividing it. And that's one of the things that, fake, uh, that, that folks fail to do is that they don't Say, let's, before we start dividing this out and thinking about that, let's make sure that we understand that everything that's important to us is part of the equation. Um, and if you ask that question and start taking people down that road, you may find things that matter to people. Um, one of the things that I, I often get asked about salary negotiations, and one of my first refrains to people is don't just think about the money. The money will be there. But what I want you to do is think about what are the other things that matter to you when it comes to a job, right? So for some people, flex time is important. For some people, um, telecommuting can be valuable. Um, for some people, healthcare benefits, whatever it might be, all of those things matter. Um, also, you know, responsibility, your title um, can be an important element of a job. All of those things expand the pie, and those are things that you could ask a prospective employer for that's really not going to cost them much. What does it cost them if you really want to telecommute a couple of days a week so you can pick your kids up from school? It doesn't cost them much as long as you're getting your job done. Um, and so you can try to sell them on that prospect. But that's how you how you uh, enlarge the pie before you divide it. And so, you know, the myth here is that sometimes we look at a situation and we say, okay, well, this is all we have to divide. So let's just start cutting it up. And you fail to explore and see what else you can create. All right. OK, Cheryl. So questions. We've got about 15 minutes. Um, I've thrown a lot at you. Um, but my goal, like I said, was to kind of push your thinking uh, about negotiation and challenge some of the commonly held notions that are out there. So 
if you want to go ahead and put in some questions, um, Cheryl can highlight those and I'm happy to answer any that you raise. Great, yes, please go ahead, type, uh, type in your questions into that empty questions box. I'll be able to um, repeat these questions out loud and uh, both Josh and I will be able to answer these um, to the group. We do have one question, will this be posted or distributed? Um, this webinar is being recorded as we speak, so this actually will be posted to our Bay Path University Institutional YouTube webpage. Um, so at the conclusion of this, give us um, just a couple of uh, business days. So midweek next week, this will be posted um, and a link will be sent out to everyone that has registered for this webinar. So you will have access to this uh, presentation. Absolutely. And we do have a comment and a question and uh, some other things coming through. So we'll get started. Um, Josh, I'll start reading these off. Okay. Sure. Uh, from Scott, thank you, Scott, um, and a comment. Thanks for the seminar, Dr. Weiss. What books would you suggest you referenced Getting to Yes, Beyond Reason, and Art of Negotiation? Any others for us? Yeah, uh, there's a couple others. I mean, it depends on how deep you want to dive, uh, but um, there is a book um, that my colleague William Yuri recently wrote called getting to yes with yourself so it's a little bit of negotiating how to negotiate with yourself most effectively so i would recommend that there's also a very good book called negotiation genius uh, that's out there um, and i did an audiobook series um, a number of years ago for the bbc that's called the negotiator and you and there are four different uh, versions of that one uh, called the negotiator and you at work one, the negotiator and you at home, if you've got kids and a spouse or parents and you want to try to think about how to negotiate more effectively with them because you certainly negotiate with them, um, that's for you. Then there's one negotiating in life, so all the negotiations around you. And then there's one specifically for salespeople um, called the negotiator and you for sales folks. So those are some. Um, there's also a number of others that um, are out there. Uh, one other, I guess I would say, is. Um, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, B-O-S-S. -S. Um, and yeah, but there's there's a lot and the world of negotiation is expanding pretty rapidly. So I hope that helps. Great, um, we have another comment and question from Amy. What is the most what what is the most excuse me important attribute a manager should have when negotiating and empowering employees? Well, I don't know if I'd have one attribute, but um, I can certainly tell you that one vital one is listening. Um, most of us think we're good listeners, but we're not really. Um, so really listening to people does a couple of things. First of all, um, if you really want to empower you know, your workforce to, to get out there and, and buy into what you're doing, you know, making them part of the process and really listening to their ideas as part of it is valuable. And, and be, you can be clear that you're not going to necessarily adopt all of their ideas, but um, making people part of the process is a really good managerial strategy. People are much more likely to actually do it when they understand the reasoning and the logic behind a plan or a way of doing things. Um, and I would also just, you know, my approach most of the time is to say to somebody working with me, look, here's your goal. Here's, let's agree on what you're going to do and then give them the freedom to do it. Um, you know, micromanaging is one of the most debilitating notions that's out there. And it, and it really saps energy and enthusiasm from employees. So. I think you want to set your employees up for success uh, and you know help them to get started in the right way but give them a clear goal and then you know let them do what they need to do you can you can build in some places where they can check in with you and see how things are going but for a lot of managers they have a really hard time with that so i think listening and and really trusting your employees to do what you're asking them to do is valuable um, if you don't trust them then you know um, 
you might want to be asking yourself, why are they still working with you? Um, Cause you have to trust them. There's no way that you can do everything. And, and I think you develop a healthy relationship with them. If you say, okay, here's your goal. Let's agree on how you're going to get there. And I'm here to help you if you need it. But, um, but I, I would say those two things are really fundamentally important because they, what they ultimately do is they empower those people uh, to do the best they can do. Great. Thanks, Josh. You're welcome, Amy. Um, a couple of comments and questions from Ilana. Thank you, Alana. What types of suggestions do you have for coming up with the right response when you are in the middle of a negotiation and may not have the option to come back to the table for a second conversation? Great question. Yeah, very good. So um, there's a concept that, um, that's been you know, bandied about for a while called going to the balcony. And going to the balcony means sort of temporarily, metaphorically stepping back to a place so you can think a little bit about um, what's being asked of you. What I find is that, um, you know, people make their biggest mistakes in the moment when they really haven't had a chance to think it through. Now, you're saying you don't have an opportunity to, you know, set up another meeting or something along those lines. But, but even as simple as saying to the other side, you know, what, let me just think about that for one minute. Um, I used to have a colleague who used to do that masterfully and, you know, and would say, you know, can we just get, can I just take five minutes to get a coffee, think about what you've said and think about my best reply? Because anytime you can step out of the heat of the moment and even just give yourself a half a minute or a minute to think about the consequences of what are be, what's being asked of you, um, you know, that's, that's a real key because more often than not, we're misunderstanding or we're not getting the complete picture. Uh, and I think most of us can relate to the notion of agreeing to something and then, you know, leaving the room or the table and realizing, Ugh, you know, that's not what I wanted to do. And I did it to relieve the anxiety and pressure of negotiation. So a lot of people feel a tremendous amount of pressure in negotiation. Um, there was a recent sort of, I wouldn't call it scientific study, but at least it was a, anecdotal study of about 8,500 people on LinkedIn who they canvassed and found that 37% of men and 26% of women were comfortable negotiating. So a lot of times people will agree to relieve the anxiety and the pressure they feel only to kind of say, wait a minute, that didn't meet my interest at all. So I think if you can even give yourself a quick little balcony trip um, to get a coffee or to go to the bathroom or just to think um, that's going to be really beneficial to you. Um, but again, if even that isn't possible, this is where the planning comes in. Um, and, you know, your preparation before you get there, understanding what your interests are, and what your objectives are, um, those are your guideposts. So, you know, if something's being asked of you that's less than your objectives, then you probably need to push back a bit and say, you know, that doesn't quite get me where I need to go. Um, and, and so, you know, the preparation and planning piece uh, becomes valuable when you're in the moment to, to, you, to serve as a benchmark to help yourself out. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question from Ilana. What types of things do you do when you are emotionally charged in a situation to bring yourself back to center as well as the other person? So. Um, another good question, and I would, and and I'll, I'll actually go back to the previous uh, answer, which is that we go to the balcony, and the balcony doesn't mean that you don't have your emotions. It means that you think about how to have them with some control. And so, um, first of all, I also, when somebody gets emotional, or if I'm feeling like I'm getting emotional, then um, I know my body tells me that now's not the right time to respond. Um, so when you start to get your emotions running, you know, your body tells you that this is happening because, and it goes back to our fight or flight instincts. And so when you start to sweat or you start to feel your blood pressure rising or your face getting flush, 
that's your body basically tell you, telling you that you've been triggered and that if you respond in the moment, you're likely going to make things worse. There's a great quote that one of my colleagues used to talk about. It was from a, a guy named Ambrose Bierce, who was an American humorist, who said, when angry, you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. And most of us make that speech at one point or another. And the balcony helps you to not do that. So um, stepping away so that you can then, and, and you can come back and still say, you know, the reason, part of the reason I stepped away was because I was really feeling angry because I thought we were heading down the road that, you know, I imagined. And now there's all these other variables that are coming in. So that's having, you know, that's having your emotions with some control, being able to express them and, and clearly lay them out. But the other thing is on the flip side, when you're dealing with somebody who is emotional, um, don't feel like you need to uh, calm them down, right? The worst thing that you can say to somebody when they are in an emotional state is, you know, let's all just calm down. Let them go, let them express their frustrations. And I would encourage folks to really listen through the emotions and maybe the criticism that's coming with them to what's important to people. So if somebody were to say to you, um, you know what, I'm beyond angry right now because you guys just keep doing the same thing over and over again, okay? Well, so focus on what they just said. They're telling you that the process has been frustrating for them. Um, and so those are some ways I often try to like listen through the criticism um, that's coming out in, a, in an emotionally charged way and try to kind of stay focused on the content of what they're telling you. Great. Uh, question from Justin. Can you elaborate briefly on how to view power differently? Sure. Um, and, and I tried to um, explain that a little bit. But basically, what I try to do is I try to look at the situation and I ask myself, OK, so if I'm dealing with somebody who perhaps, you know, well, let's just say on paper has more power, they have more ability, like my boss, um, where do they have the ability to really influence things? So <clears throat> one thing that's important to understand is that power is a relational concept, right? Someone only has power over me if I value what it is that they possess, right? So if I have a boss and they can fire me, then they have power over me, right? Um, except if I don't really like my job, <laughs> then I don't really care if they fire me or I don't, uh, you know, so, how much power do they really have? But what I would say, it, one way to try to evaluate this is to ask yourself the question, how much power does the other person have and in what way? And then I would ask yourself the question, what power do I have to influence the situation? Do I have knowledge? Um, if you know how to negotiate effectively, again, that's a form of power. Um, if you can build a coalition of employees, I, I, I'll share a quick little story with you. So I had a student uh, who's a nursing student uh, when I was teaching a class many years ago at Simmons College. And um, she came to me and she said, okay, so I have this problem. My boss is borderline verbally abusive and I can't quit because I need this job. So like, and I've approached him and said, I really want you to stop this. And he doesn't seem to be interested in stopping it. So what do I do now? <laughs> um, and that's a difficult situation. But I said to her, well, let me ask you a question. Um, so you've tried this and, and they're not interested. Um, how many people are in your department? Uh, there's about 15. And I said, well, okay. And she said, you know, 10 of them are nurses and then some other folks. And I said, and how many of them hold the same perspective that you hold? And she said, oh, all of them. He's like this with everybody. And I said, okay, well, what if you were to go with your entire group of folks and say, we're no longer willing to work in this manner, unless something changes, um, you know, we may leave in mass. Um, and I said, obviously you have to mean that, but power in numbers can counteract some of that power that he possesses over all of you. So it turns out, she said, that's interesting. Let me try to talk to the folks in my department and see if they would be willing. And it turned out that um, they were willing, but before they did that, they went to their supervisor's boss and explained the situation and said that 
you know, something had to change. And it turned out that he was unaware of what was going on. And anyways, make a long story short, they went to the boss and said, look, um, unless something changes, we're not prepared to stay working under these conditions. And he said, fine, why don't you quit? They all, they already had the confirmation from his boss that things needed to change. So they then went back to his boss and said, look, we approached him. We explained that we weren't prepared to keep working this way. And he said, too bad. And it, basically what ended up happening is that guy got fired um, because he was unwilling to deal with this. So one of the questions is to always be asking yourself, there's got to be something we can do here. What is it? And sometimes it requires creativity. It requires you know, building those coalitions, um, reaching out to people, thinking about uh, power in that way. And so I always ask myself the question, you know, where does my power lie and how can I improve my position before I get to the table? Those things should help. Great. Any other questions? Please don't be shy. Feel free to type those in. Okay, well, we will go ahead and, and wrap up the webinar for today. Josh, any uh, parting words and, and comments? Um, no, just to say thank you very much to everybody for taking an hour out of your day. If you do, if you did find this interesting and you know you want to learn more about the programming, this is the kind of stuff that we dive into and and examine in great detail. Um, so if this was inter interesting to you, you can visit the leadership and negotiation page and and um, explore. And I'd be happy to chat with you if you're interested in the program. So thank you very much for, for coming and I hope you found it helpful. Great, thanks so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And again, this will be available as a recorded YouTube link, which will be distributed um, by myself um, within the next um, several business days. So be on the lookout for this by midweek next week in your email inboxes. Thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day and enjoy your weekends. Thank you, bye-bye.